I am David Fiddle. I am a pastoral psychotherapist in San Rafael, California, um, just north of San Francisco. And this webinar is sponsored by the Pacific Region as a contribution to the continued development of pastoral counseling as a profession. Frequently, when I mention transactional analysis in the United States, an older respondent will make a reference to the 1970s and 1980s. Um, a younger therapist won't even know what I'm talking about, will never have heard about it. Um, but interestingly, if the other counselor with whom I'm speaking is from Latin America, from Japan, from Europe, from England, from Australia, the response is usually much more aware and much more approving. TA is actually a fairly major force in other geographical areas. In the, U in the US, the therapy counseling community tends to be easily distracted by shiny baubles of new acronyms and uh, supposedly new, uh, often unproven forms of therapy. Transactional analysis fell victim to that trend in the 1980s. Um, yet TA almost uniquely is able to bridge the worlds of psychodynamic and behaviorally oriented therapies. Eric Byrne described a psychodynamic model of emotional and, uh, and mental functioning that went further and anchored his model in behavioral observation. Descriptions of parent, adult, and child of games, strokes, time structuring, and so on are behaviors. But ob observing them led to psychodynamic model that continues to lend itself to diagnosis and treatment of emotional dysfunction. So our guest lecturer today is Felipe Garcia. Felipe is a training and supervising clinical transactional anal analyst, and he is le a leading force in the International Transactional Analysis Association. Based on his research and his 40 years of practice, he will be a major presen presenter at the upcoming World TA Conference in San Francisco uh, in two weeks. Felipe, you're there. Will you punch your camera so we can see you? Um, you got it. There it is. Fantastic. I'm going to leave you alone, and I'll be around listening. All right, and be uh, and certainly make any comments or questions. Uh, you know, as 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 we go forward. I'm assuming you're hearing me. I'm assuming everybody's hearing me. Everybody's you. hearing you. All right, great. Well, I'm delighted to be with you today, and I'm a little scared and nervous because I've never done a webinar. And teaching transactional analysis without transactions is a little <laughs> scary uh, in terms of feedback. Uh, so yes, we're inviting you to ask muted. questions. And there's a, a particular time I will stop periodically to look and see, look at the questions and see which ones can we can answer. We have now about an hour and 25 minutes left, and there's a lot of material in transactional analysis. So I'm going to cover the four areas and define them as we move forward. Uh, but I'm going to em emphasize two of the areas, and that is uh, structural and functional analysis and transactional analysis. I mentioned games, and we'll talk a little bit about it. And then at the end, I will talk about an intervention tool that I have developed uh, and use uh, with my clients in terms of treatment. Um, as David said, I've been in practice for about 40 years, both uh, in using transactional analysis personally, as well as uh, individually in groups, and then at a, in organizational and educational settings. And today, I am thankful to have a colleague of mine who is also a longtime student of transactional analysis, who will be helping me as somebody here that I can talk to and that can ask questions live, and also will read the questions that you send in, because it's difficult for me to read with my vision, uh, my impaired vision. 
as I go through the material today, I will try to use a three-step formula, which will be to define the, the concept and then to uh, talk a little bit about diagnosing clients using that concept, and, and some, and, and as time permits, some areas about treatment and intervention in terms of that, in terms of that concept. So let me see. Oh, I'm using. Uh, uh, all right. So here's the definition of transactional analysis, and we, we will go into detail about several of these areas as we move forward. Transactional analysis is a developmental theory of personality, and I am a uh, developmental therapist. I, I emphasize in my work, as I will illustrate to you later, uh, how I use the development of the ego states uh, either in what was healthily developed and what, what needs remedial work in order to use the ego states to function uh, in a way in one's own behalf and in relating with the world around us. It's a systematic psychotherapeutic approach, and actually it's more than one systematic psychotherapeutic approach. There are several schools of transactional analysis. Uh, the classical school was the living system in San the area called the Redecision School, Parenting School, we talked about that, but the concepts are still very useful in school. And a very popular one in Europe these days is called the Relational School and an Associate Analysis, which transactional analysis are reading from. I'll say a little bit more about that. Communication, and we'll talk about that more. Also, a philosophy of really also cover uh, as you follow. Philosophical assumptions that do based on all the some things are in what you're experiencing to the transactional. I'm going to try to open up basic conversion depth for those who already know some of the basic How do you experience and work with personalities and relationships? It is ongoing. I've been working for years still and found myself in others every time I apply the concept. The first one is that all humans are okay and have the capacity to think and feel. There are two parts to that. That they are okay is that everybody has human dignity and worth. It's important in working with clients as soon as possible to invite them in some way to be aware of that because that's often ignored and forgotten, and I'll talk about how I use that basically through a concept, through an exercise in breathing and centering. I'm doing a workshop at the conference in San Francisco called The Power of Being and Relating with Self and Others, and it's about using mindfulness and the breath to set up space between me and my feelings and my thinking and my reacting to you so that I can um, uh, be more effective in my communicating with you and with myself. The other one is that everybody has the capacity to feel and think. Everybody doesn't feel and think because of restrictions that may have been placed on people as they were growing up. But the assumption is you can think and you can learn to think and you can learn to listen to your feelings. And that's a basic assumption that we operate from. People are okay. You can learn to think and feel. You have the capacity to, except for the limited um, population that have of a mental uh, handicap of some kind that prevents them from accurate uh, uh, adult thinking. Uh, people decide their own destiny, and that's the redecision school. But it is really based. It's like per parents have parents and the environment have an impact on the child growing up. It is the child that makes the decision about how they're going to relate and 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 grow up and and still relate to the restrictions attribution and expectations of the environment. So there is some decision that the child and their life story, and that change, that decision is uh, Floyd talked about the Oedipal complex as the issue uh, drive and sexual relation, the sexual attraction, the Oedipal complex. Uh, transactional analysis means that the, that the here is um, they, it's because of three hungers, and there's, which are stimulus, hunger, a need for stimulation, 
in one's life, a need for recognition. We're going to talk a lot about recognition, which in TA we call strokes. And I have position hunger here, which is also important, but I really ought needed to add an, a fourth one, and I will. The position hunger I added by accident. Uh, but position hunger is that we have a tendency to want to know how I stand in relationship to you. Like, very often in a group, we'll try to find out, and what do I do? Oh, and do you have more education? And are you more important than me? That's position hunger. It's trying to know how I relate to you in terms of importance. But the other third hunger really is structure hunger. We'll talk about structure more. And so stimulation, recognition, and structure hunger are really the three basic hungers that drive our behavior. And, and we will talk about that as we go forward. Simple language. Um, Eric Brown, who was the originator of these concepts, a psychiatrist from Canada who settled in San Francisco in the Carmel area, uh, was in training to become a trans, uh, psychoanalyst and became very disillusioned because he had his own ideas and wanted to go on his own path. He thought that psychoanalysis was very mysterious and expensive and long-term for clients. And he wanted to develop a theory that was more, effect, more useful, more, more user-friendly, and develop concepts that we go through. Here you will hear the basic common everyday words that he used to describe very complicated concepts. And it is those basic, that simple language that um, evolved into what David was talking about, of people thinking that it was just jargony, simple, and, uh, and uh, pop psychology. The, I think transactional analysis, the deeper that you can get into understanding the, the importance and the the, the, the contractual model Burn was writing this contractual model was very new. I think it's more uh, common in everyday psychotherapy today. But it, 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 it contrasted psychoanalysis and the medical model where the the medical doctor and they treat you, they diagnose you and treat you. In in transactional analysis, the contractual model implies that you can think, you can be responsible for your life, I will join you in the process of you learning how to solve your problems, but it is up to you to solve your problems, and I won't work with you on goals that I have for you, I'm going to work with you on goals that we agree upon that I'm going to support you on. And if you want to read more model of transactional analysis, you can read uh, any of Claude Steiner's materials, Dr. Claude Steiner, who is a Californian. But his book, Scripts People Live, uh, goes into great detail about the contractual model of transactional analysis. Um, I am a little overwhelmed because of time the amount of material I want to if I'm going too fast from a uh, hurry up driver. And my friend here, Dutch, who I'm, I was going to ask him to say hello, and you can see him. Hello. Did they see? You? He's here. Okay. There is a real person. Um, open communication refers to uh, again the transactional analysis calls the people that they're and patients because it's a client that I'm working with rather than a patient that I'm curing. Um, uh, the communication is open, and in the relationship model in particular is that we talk about how I'm feeling about what you're saying. And it's an interactional model rather than a one-way model, as psychoanalysis was. Um, oops. I pushed the wrong button. Close. Push the wrong button here. Next. Uh, it's applicable in many areas. Uh, the main area that I'm hoping you begin to apply it on is personal application as, as we go through the material. Today, of course, clinical practice. Um, and couples therapy, I find it very useful in couples therapy, particularly the contractual aspect of it. I've done it in educational settings for motivation and discipline, and done a lot of work in applications of uh, organizational. And then sports and arts, there's a lot of ways in which other fields use transactional analysis in order to help people stay out of their way about being successful. That's usually how it's used in those areas. I said a little bit about Eric Byrne. Um, 
and he he was working in San Francisco, and Eric Byrne was very curious about intuition, and um, he, and intuition didn't have a place in psychoanalysis, so that was part of the driving force uh, that drove him into deciding that he wanted to divide the, the, the ego and study the ego because the superego and Ian, to him, were abstract terms that weren't very useful, and he wanted to develop a model that was based on behavioral observations and change. Uh, the San Francisco Seminar met every Tuesday for decades, I, th I think until very recently, all the way from the early, early 60s. And there were other psychiatrists, nurses, and psychologists who were interested in transactional analysis, and it was all of them together that would give presentations and continue to develop the concept. And this continues to be so with organizations David mentioned all over the world. Transactional analysis is very popular all over the world. And they'll all be meeting in San Francisco um, in a couple of weeks, uh, on the, starting the 6th of August. And I hope you can join us for that. There is a transactional analysis journal, and uh, which you can subscribe to. And, and the other source of information is the website, the International Transactional Analysis website, and also the United States of America Transactional Analysis website. And you'll find a lot of information there. Uh, we will be covering a lot of material, and, and you probably won't get it all, so don't worry about it, because David says that you can download this video after this presentation so that you can review that. And I'm going to recommend, I don't know if you can see this book, it's T.A.K. by Van Jones and Ian Stewart. Um, and it is a book that covers all of the material that I covered today and more. Normally, an introduction to TA is called a TA 101, and it's a two-day, 12-hour course. So we're going to try to do 12 hours in one hour today. But not really. I'm going to emphasize some of the areas and invite you to follow up on the other areas on your own. Um, so here are the four areas of transactional analysis. And we'll stop after this to see if you have any questions. Any questions coming in? No. All right, so these are the four areas of transactional analysis. Structural analysis, I'm just going to define them here because we're going to go into detail with structure and function later and somewhat with transactional analysis proper also. Structural analysis is the makeup of the personality. What makes a person what they are? What experiences makes them who they are? And we're going to look at the model that talks about that developmentally. And then what, and then what are the behaviors that the person operates from and how do those impact other people's behaviors and the relationship in between the two. So it's a structural and functional model. More about that when we get to the next slide. Transactional analysis proper is, the whole thing is called transactional analysis. And this is called transactional analysis proper, is the analysis of transactions. The reason that transactional analysis is called transactional analysis and not interactional analysis is because there's an exchange of something when people talk to each other or ignore each other. And that something is called strokes. And so you see that um, the, the three areas under transactional analysis is the analysis of the exchange of strokes, which we will go into more detail later as time permits, but there could be positive or negative strokes, and, and, and how that impacts people and how people use them based on their beliefs about themselves and others uh, determines how they reinforce their life script of their, or life story that they're living. The analysis of transactions, we'll talk about three types of transactions when we get to that. And then also the, the area of time structure, uh, which will also uh, identify the six ways of structuring time that Byrne described. Uh, Game analysis is the analysis of repetitive patterns of interaction where people end up feeling bad. Everybody in the, in the interactions, it could be two-handed games or it can be multiple-handed games, or even it can be one own game in one's head, where I repeat the same pattern over and over and end up feeling bad uh, and reinforcing my belief about myself and the world. And that's trans, uh, game analysis. We will not talk about game analysis today very much, but I will provide you with a model that I use with people in order to help them avoid games. And I think that if they learn what to do instead of playing games, that 
playing games does not have to be emphasized very much. Script analysis we will not is the fourth area, and we will not get into much uh, today on script analysis. You can read more about that with Eric Burns' book called What Do You Say After You Say Hello? It's an in-depth, profound book about uh, um, about scripts. Uh, um, Richard Erskine just published a book about three years ago on scripts. I don't remember the name. I'm sorry. But you can find it listed in the International Transactional Analysis Association. And then Claude Steiner's book called Scripts People Live. You can get a lot of information about that uh, in any of those publications. So those are the four areas, structural and functional, transactional, proper, game and script. We will, we will focus more on the first two today. The slide isn't changing for some reason. The slides are stuck. Anyway, uh, uh, David, are you there? Oh, yeah. hmm. They they are changing. Oh, I got to keep my mind. Your line is now unmuted. Yeah, the the slides are are changing. I don't know why you're not seeing it, but they they are changing. Oh, they're not changing in my on my screen. Okay. I still have the four areas. Which uh, well, here it's it's telling me to it's something is happening to me. Yeah. Um, okay. The, the, we we now have first order okay, structural model model up. What slide are you on? The first order structural model slide. I don't know what this means. PAC, basic PAC. <laughs> Asking if you should go ahead and uh, if they can see the slide. You want the slide on? You just see. Can you see the slide? And what slide are we on? Because I am having a problem on my computer. I'm getting a, okay. one of those uh, time wait a signal Think, thinking signal. We are on slide number eight. First order mm -hmm. structural model. I don't know what this thing is. You, don't need any of those. you with me? You just need to click somewhere. You you went past definition of ego states, and the next slide says is the parent adult child. Felipe, are you listening to me? Hello, Felipe. Felipe, your your video went off, and I don't know where you went. Uh, maybe you're rebooting or something. Uh, the slide we're now on says first order structural model, and I'm going to pick up until he comes back. Are you there? OK, I don't know. No no video, Felipe. Parrot, the parent ego state is the behaviors and thoughts and feelings we get from not just our parents, but parental figures, uh, teachers, uh, other people who occupy a parental position in our lives. The child ego state, which is the first to develop, is what we begin with. And uh, it's really the only part of the structure that exists at the, at the, in the early years. Eventually, the adult ego state is that part of our mind that deals with uh, thoughts and feelings which are direct response to the here and now. The adult is the executive uh, when we're working fully so that we need parent. There you go. Are you there? Oh, you're back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are on 
the slide that just has first order structure, PAC, and I was explaining. Yeah. I was explaining parent, uh, child, and adult, and the adult. Okay, now that's the next one. That's second order. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to see that it's working. Can I just go? Yeah. So you did you define all three of those? I did. All right. So there's a. Um, uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about this, the, the, the way that this, these three ego states develop in the mind of Eric Byrne before we go into the structure. Okay. Um, Eric Byrne had a client who was a lawyer. And the, I always cry when I tell this story. I'm not going to today. I practice. <laughs> but anyway, he had, uh, and it's called a cowboy story. He had a client who was a lawyer. And this was before the development of the ego state. And the lawyer told, was telling a story to, um, to Eric Byrne, and he said that when he was a little boy, he was at a boys camp, and, and they were teaching them how to ride horses. And that the instructor told the little boy, get on the horse, cowpoke. And he said, and I felt like telling the, the instructor, I'm not a cowpoke, I'm just a little boy. And, um, and the, uh, the lawyer said to Eric Byrne, I often feel that way in life. Is I'm not a lawyer. I'm just a little boy. And Eric Byrne began to be interested in that and seeing that repetitive parent, uh, pattern and dividing the difference between that part of ourselves, which is a grown-up, which is the adult, the thinker, and the little boy, which is still there. And there's a lot of research, and particularly with a new uh, a research in brain, in, in brain research, that actually uh, the research that was being back, done back there is they were doing studies in epilepsy. They would touch different parts of the brain, and memories and experiences from childhood would come, would be the person would start speaking as if they were in that period in time. Redecision therapy is based on that capacity for people to re reenact a scene uh, that was traumatic in the past and post-traumatic stress. Uh, reduction, as you know, is, is that way too, where those memories that we uh, uh, captured in childhood are recorded live and they can be revisited in order to work with and re-decide. That's a theory of uh, transactional analysis. So that's the first order structure. Um, the second order structure, which is, it, you know, if I spend a lot of time on this is because I think it's very important. And this is an interesting way to look at clients. So briefly, I'm going to talk about how this, the, um, um, the ego states develop. And, and this, again, is structure. So this is the makeup of the person, not yet functional. We'll talk about functional next. I'm going to start with the child ego state at the bottom, C1. You see the, the child is divided into a PAC inside the child, and the parent is divided into PAC in the parent, several actually. We'll talk about the parent later. I'm going to start with the child. If I, I could have another diagram here where only on the right, if I had two ego state diagrams next to each other, on the right is the child ego state C1. That's the baby, even from uh, prenatal, the baby is having experiences and, and, uh, and recording experiences. And the six, zero to six month old child is is an infant, and what that child is needing is nurturing, support, uh, and uh, the mother figuring out what the cries are about. The mother or the caretaker, whoever the caretaker or the a caretaker, take care of the child in, in response to his cries. Uh, how the parents and the environment is be, be, uh, responding to the child's natural developmental needs will, to a large extent, determine how the person themselves respond to their own internal needs later in life and also who they are attracted to to repeat in the, in the games over and over a pattern where the mother was ignoring of the ch child, they'll experience themselves ignoring their own needs and, and they are attracted to people who will do that for them too. So that's interesting. So anyway, zero to six months is the, soman the uh, somantic or the, the baby child, the infant. Then uh, six to 18 months, the child begins to crawl and explore. That's called the exploratory period. And, uh, um, and the child begins to develop the, what's called the little professor in the child. That's the, in, the intuition that Byrne was so interested in. 
and beginning to realize that there's an environment out there besides me. And that leads to the next stage, which is the 18 months to three years, in which two things begin to happen. The, 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 ver the child begins to be verbal and therefore begins to develop the B-gay, the adult ego state, and the, uh, and the pig, what's called the witch parent or the, it's the parent in the child, which is an early parent that the child develops in order to set limits on themselves to try to stay out of problems with the grown-ups and also make decisions about themselves. The two aspects going on during the development of the P1. The P1 is developing during the separation stage between the uh, months of 18 and uh, 18 months and three years, and also between the ages of three years and seven or eight years, which are called the magical child, magical years. During the three to six or seven year old development, the need at that point is the continuation of the, the previous ones, one is to respond to their needs, to nurture them from the first, to uh, allow them to explore and follow their own instinct, and, and also at this stage, the three to seven or eight, is to differentiate between what's real and what's not real. The child has a great imagination, and this is where that scary ghost under the bed or uh, something, the, the monster in the closet, helping children differentiate about what's real and not real with a lot of nurturing about it's wonderful that you have imaginary friends and they're different from the real people, you're a real friend. So that's, what, that's the need during the developmental stages at that time. The other thing that can happen here that will later manifest itself as problems as a grown-up is the, um, the grandiosity of the child believe in his or her own power. A uh, couple of examples about that. Uh, we, first of all, about the magical child. Uh, obsessive compulsive very often is based on that magical child belief. Uh, remember those times when you would walk on the sidewalk and didn't want to step on the lines because if you stepped on the lines, uh, something bad will happen. Or if you avoided the lines, you will avoid the witch from coming, those kind of stories. That's the, the magical child that as grown-ups, have trouble differentiating what's real from what's not imagined. The other thing is the power that they have over others. A mother, for instance, or a father who is crying over something that they're disturbed about a divorce or somebody died in the family, and particularly they're chronically depressed, and the child of five or six comes and by the mere fact that he presents himself to the mother and the mother or the father stays paying attention, and they smile and they feel better, the child makes a decision about a grandiose decision that I can make people feel better. And they will often go through life being ministers, <laughs> pastoral counselors, <laughs> trying to, or therapists like I am. Um, and we have to be real clear about how, what we can help with, that's a contractual model, and what um, why we don't have the capacity to change. So that confusion, stems from that three to eight-year-old developmental period. Another thing that's happening between the three and eight-year-old developmental child is that they're uh, into uh, gender role identification. They're asking a lot of questions about what are boys like, what are girls like, what I'm going to wear, what I will wear or not wear. So they have a lot of interest in gender. So that's another part of the development, healthy development that's occurring at that time. Um, beginning about eight or nine, the symbiosis between the mother and the child begins to separate and the expectation that the child think more and, and ask for what they want rather than the mother figure it out is an important part of the healthy development. Codependency in greater life is a, a result of not either under supported periods during the symbiotic period where the child, well the grown-up's child is trying to attract somebody to fulfill the unfulfilled uh, parental needs or because they, the separation was never done successfully. The mother stayed attached or the baby stayed attached and the dependency continued. So that's the development of the child ego state and the adult ego state. About nine, eight or nine, the, the parent begins to develop with values and morals and rules and, and how to do things in life. 
and we incorporate what this model represents in terms of the parent adult child is that we incorporate the whole of the person that um, is parenting us or having an influence on us. I have three there because I had my mother and my father and a sister who was 15 years older than me who was very influential in my life. And I find myself often behaving like her uh, either from her parent and the way she thought about things and also enjoying things that I learned from her like classical music. I really relate when I'm in classical music, actually all music, uh, my sister and my mother who were very much in, uh, interested in that. So now I'm going to stop for a moment, take a sip of water and take a breath. And if you have any questions, please send them in uh, or any comments that you'd like to make at this point, or in, uh, including asking Dutch over here to see if he has a comment or question. No, doing fine. No questions? No. Felipe, uh, your video is off. You mean it's not on? You're, you're not on screen. Now you're coming back. There you are. Good to see you. Could you hear me? We heard you fine. The, the audio was fine, it's just not the video. OK. Um, I'm sorry you missed all my gestures. Yeah, well, and your beautiful face. <laughs> How are the listeners doing? I mean, did you say to do a check mark, or is it too overwhelming, or is it too fast, or anything? Anybody want to send a, a thumbs up or a question or anything before we move forward? What is this over here? Oh, OK. So all right, so that's the structural uh, ego state model. I'm going to move on to the next. I, um, I was going to tell a couple of stories here, wasn't I? No? OK. I'll go to the functional model next. If you're okay, no questions. People are not asking questions. Somebody said so far this is pretty basic. Okay. All right. I have now again changed the the slide. slide. There. Oops. Changed too much. Yeah. David, I'm having trouble changing the slide for some reason. Okay. Um, it's changing. It should be showing up. It is? Yeah, it is changing. You're now way back, way back on slide five. You need to go forward, not back. That was when we get to the functional model. Yeah. Okay. Let me, I'll change the slides for you. Here's the functional model is up now. Okay, good. Well, it's hard to do without the functional model in my face, but yeah. I go ahead. Um, so um, the functional ego states are um, this, these moves from structure to function. This is how the person behaves. And uh, the, I'm going to start with a child ego state where the free child or the natural child is the person behaves with words and body uh, gestures and body positions as, as they were when they were a child. Wow, and yay, and oh, I'm scared, or I can't do it, or no, I won't. That's all child, free child behavior. The adapted child is the, uh, developed because of the socialization, and the child will operate, uh, the adapted child operates with may I, uh, whatever you decide. Oh, the right, oh, we're in the right uh, place now. Uh, so the adapted child can either be adapted, compliant, or it can be rebellious. It's not in this model, but you will see it in a lot of models, that uh, people may get stuck in that separation two-year-old stage, which it doesn't matter what you say or do, they're going to find um, they're always going to get stuck with wanting to argue with you or saying no. I find lawyer clients, I have many lawyer clients, I find them very often into a rebellious position stuck with their father because I always ask him, did you ever have a chance to win an argument with their father? And usually the answer is no. Adult function is the answers and ask questions, how, when, what, where, who. And the nurturing parent is uh, nurturing and caretaking, don't worry, I'll, everything is going to be all right. And the critical or controlling parent sets boundaries. The next slide 
You're going to change it, David? Sure. It's changed. What is it? Well, I'm changing that. No. Okay, the positive, the positive and negative aspects of these behaviors, they can either be positive or negative. Um, so that the nurturing, the, let me start at the ch free child again. The free child positive behaviors are to have fun and enjoy and contribute and be creative. The, the inappropriate or negative use of the child ego state, uh, natural child, is when you are disruptive or you don't follow the rules when you're supposed to and you need to in order to survive. Uh, and that's the positive and negative use of the free child. The adaptive child is, again, positive is when you, when you, if you pay your taxes, you stay on the right side of the road, you dress appropriately for work or you dress at all, you go to the bathroom for the bathroom use. Uh, and the inappropriate or negative use of the adaptive child is to always adapt to somebody else ways rather than initiating, waiting for what the other person says. I always think of over-adapted child ego state when couples are into, where do you want to go eat? Oh, I don't care. Where do you want to? Well, it doesn't matter. And both being in an adapted, adapted position, and decisions often don't get made that way. Or there's the adapted child negative behavior where they are always staying in a relationship with somebody who's always leading and parenting and telling them what to do. That's a negative use of a child ego state. Um, the adult, I don't want to get into the details of how the adult can be used. The only way that the adult can be used negatively is if, they, if, if you're over detailing or thinking instead of feeling, instead of relating when you need to be relating and all you're doing is talking about data. Uh, the negative nurturing, the positive nurturing parent is soothing and comforting and appropriate. The inappropriate nurturing parent is when you're doing is dysfunctional rescuing, taking care of somebody when they haven't asked you to take care of them or in ways that they don't need and they could do it themselves. And the negative critical parent is a critical parent that is um, uh, punitive, condemning, and is not to, is to be avoided. And the positive use of critical parent is to set boundaries, to set limits, both on oneself and on others. Uh, a couple of things that I want to say about this functional model is that it, it will, it, we use it in relating to others. We can come from any of these five behaviors as we relate to others. And, uh, and we can also use it in terms of relating to ourselves. And this is where I find it very useful in, in psychotherapy in terms of diagnosis and treatment. I had a client come see me. Uh, and I want to talk about this client in particular named David. He came as a couple, and very often couples come because, or at least sometimes couples come, because one or the other, and usually the man is not getting enough, feeling like they're not having enough sexual intimacy. And, uh, what was, and he was also very dependent and very uh, needy of his wife. And both of them had been uh, raised without a nurturing parent, or without a parent present. The parents were absent for one reason or another. And, um, and, and so what you have, what David had, was a lot of fan, uh, fan, uh, magical child, very scared child, uh, very needy child. And the decision that he had made about himself is, I don't matter. I don't matter was a very basic decision. My needs don't matter. And so he has an absent parent in his head. There is no parent. There's no nurturing parent there. There's not a lot of critical parent there or, or limit-setting parent. So he had been a drug abuser. By this point, he had already left, gotten off the drugs, because I don't do drug treatment. But he was still smoking a lot, and he had had a heart attack. And, he, and so in terms of treatment, the first part of the treatment is to begin to help, and remember I mentioned three schools of treatment, so it can be from a classical school. It, in the classical school of treatment is to up the nurturing parent as much as possible. If they don't have a nurturing parent, is use what's called um, uh, self-reparenting, where I use two chairs and put him in one chair where he's needy, uh, and put him in another chair and coach the, him in the other chair to be a nurturing person to the to the needy child so that he begins to develop a parent uh, that's available to his child. 
There's another piece that I hear in terms of uh, intervention in this kind of a uh, dysfunction, and that is where I, I very, all my clients, I teach them very early on to do meditating or breathing exercise. It takes about two minutes to just breathe and relax, mindful exercise, let go. So the, and then as, as much as they can get in touch with that unconditional self, uh, beyond and above thinking and feeling and scared and so on, it's for them to understand that there's a part of them that is that okay part that's worthy of dignity and respect and to be taken care of in survival. So that's another type of intervention to do with these, these people who are latched. I find a lot of people coming to, to uh, psychotherapy because they don't have the ego state, parent ego state that they need to help them take care of themselves. The other type of kind that I get are overparented, uh, or either overparented in one of two ways. One is because they were um, the the one of the parents was very critical and would yell at them a lot and and off and even abuse them, and the child doesn't always know what or why they were abused, but what they do decide is that they're not okay and there's something wrong with them, even though they don't know what it is. And also, they internalize that critical parent, so they have a lot of internal, they have a lot of internal uh, uh, putting themselves down, being critical of themselves in terms of in, internal dialogue. That's one type of overparenting. The treatment for that has to, again, be very similar to the other one. The first is to stop the use of the critical parent to teach them the breathing exercise, to, to do a lot of what's called decontamination, and we'll talk about very briefly contamination in a moment, where you, where they're saying, I'm not okay, and you ask, how do you know that? Who told you that? Where did you learn that? Decontamination work is, is talking with them about facts, uh, opinions that they're sharing as if they were fact about themselves or other people, and asking adult questions in order to get them to clarify what it is, where it is that they learned that, and hopefully to understand that it's a myth or an opinion and not necessarily a fact. So that's part of the treatment that you can do, that, that I do in working with overparented children who have a very critical parent. There's the overparented child, like I had with a mother who is overprotective, which also sends a message to the child that, you can take care of yourself, and you, you need me. Um, and so the, it, it, it's a process of the child trusting that they can take care of themselves, they can solve problems. And uh, your line is now muted. Feedback and echo that I'm getting. So that. Um, uh, so anyway, that is a functional model and some hopefully some examples of uh, how you can diagnose it and see it in your client. Is there any questions? Yeah, as much as I want to. I'm trying to change the slide. You changed it. Your line is now unmuted. You're you have changed it. You're now on the next what? slide. Say what? What's it say? Contaminations. Okay, contaminations. That slide hasn't changed on my screen, but maybe it will. But I mentioned a little bit about contamination. And parent contamination is prejudice, um, prejudiced opinions about others like blacks are lazy or dangerous or Mexicans are dirty. Or you're not okay. You're you'll never amount to anything, for instance. And operating out of that uh, belief as if it's real. That's a contamination. Decontamination is work that you do using adult questioning um, to um, to try to get them to understand. I was working with a lawyer last week where he believes that if somebody did something on purpose to hurt him. And it's his opinion that the other person did something on purpose rather than it might have been he, he was out of his awareness, and but it had a negative impact on him. He was convinced that the only way to deal with that situation was to drop his friend. 
uh, which he has done over and over through life, is when everybody, anytime anybody hurts him, he, leave, he drops them and goes on, and he ends up with no friends, and he's very sad and lonely, and he, in, in my helping him try to identify that pattern, and that it is that belief that he did it on purpose, and therefore I'm angry at you, and I'm going to kick you out. We'll talk about that existential life position as we get to that position next. So that's contamination. Child contamination is a corresponding contamination, so that in terms of blacks are dangerous, the child is going to be scared of blacks. Um, in terms of you are a mess and you'll never amount to anything, the contamination in child is I'll never amount to anything. And so all of that can be identified through transactions by paying attention to how they respond to transactions and then intervening in some way to, uh, to, to help a redecision going. So the redecision will never amount to anything. It's going back to where that and it's where you experience that for the first time, doing two chair work in terms of being in that place in the here and now, experiencing that, and then knowing what you know now, what new decision can you make about yourself, which is, I can do things, I can do learn things, I can learn things, and I can depend on myself. It's an example of doing redecision re work in terms of working with child or parent contamination. Exclusion, which is the next slide. It's not, Huh? It's the third one. This one. No. Yeah, there, there, there. Exclusion. Uh, there is psychotic and just neurotic um, levels of both of these. Uh, uh, pathology in TA is looked at in terms of contamination and exclusion. Yeah, the exclusion parent, excluded parent ego state. If it really is an excluded parent ego state, because it was so toxic that the child decided not to internalize it, that is what constitutes a factor disorder, a sociopath, because they operate out of a contaminated adult and child, and they don't have morals, they're not restricted by morals, so they're very, very intelligent, and they have a lot of intuition, and they learn how to take advantage of people because they don't have a parent ego state. A child ego, a, a, a excluded child ego state not at the pathology level, but at the neurotic or just common everyday problem that people bring in my office. Uh, excluded child, examples of excluded child, I find very often firstborn, either boys or girls, or only children, because they have to grow up very fast. Uh, uh, firstborns, particularly they have siblings coming to, uh, after them, uh, were having to parent the siblings help the mother or father or the caretakers with the siblings and ignore their own needs very early in life. And so I find very often when I ask them, and how do you feel about that? That's how I diagnose when, um, when, a, when a person has an excluded child and they'll answer with an opinion or a thought. And um, an excluded child, a person who didn't have permission to be a child growing up because they were parenting their siblings or because they were adults or because it was not okay for them to be playful and youthful and have feelings and etc., they learn to grow up very fast. One of the ways that I diagnose ego states uh, is that early on, the very first session, I will ask two questions. Well, several questions, but it, they're, they're basically two, is to identify their parent and their child. So I will ask them to describe their mother in three words, and I will ask them to describe their father in three words, or whoever it was that brought them up. And they give me a lot of information about what their parent ego state is made of, absent, critical, helpful, nurturing, loving. So I get a picture of what's happening in their parent ego state very quickly. And then I ask them for the child information, I ask three questions. What do you do when you're scared? What do you do when you're sad? And what do you do when you're mad? And what do you do for fun? I also ask that to see the extent to which there might be an excluded child. Very often the reason they're there in therapy is that they don't know what to do with those. Either I don't feel them and respond to them, so I don't know or I incapacitate, or they're using substitute feelings, which we're going to talk about when we get to the model of intervention that I mentioned earlier. But so for diagnosing ego states, uh, the the
Hello. Oh, uh, we seem to have lost the audio from your, and we've lost your camera. Felipe, we seem to have lost both the audio and your video. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I'm not sure what Felipe was going to say more than this about exclusion. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to, to move forward with that. But, uh, Felipe, you're, you're not, we're not hearing you at all. Um, and we're not seeing, I mean, the image we have of you on the screen is, uh, frozen. So, there must may be something wrong with your computer. The, the problem with doing webinars is always technical. Um, let me see, see if I can uh, say a word. Hope that everybody is hearing me. I think, I think my, I think my mic is still working. Okay. So he's pretty much explained the exclusions. Um, in any case, what it's doing is excluding the ego state, or you, we've all known people who exclude both parent and child who operate like a computer. At least that's the image that comes to mind. And that's, a, and that's of course a problem. Um, okay. I, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, and I apologize that I'm not an expert in TA. I study TA. I'm a clinical member of ITA, but I have contaminated my TA with uh, cognitive behavior therapy. And that works out fine for me because it's very easy to map uh, many of the, many of the explanations and many of the ideas. Uh, but we're going to move on to the transactional analysis. And what transactional analysis looks at is the responses, the, the transactions. Um, easy illustration for that I use frequently with um, easy illustration that I use with uh, clients, uh, couples who come in. There are times when he gets sick and she is his mother, and he he drops into Oh, I am feeling bad, and you know, take care of me, and, and that's fine. So he sends a message, a child message, to her parent, and her nurturing parent comes back and says, okay, here's some chicken soup, or whatever. Um, the other kind of use of, the, of, the, of that transaction is when uh, he tells her she's wasting money, uh, he, he, she spends money like water, and you know it's time to stop that. And he gets on her case from his critical parent. Her response from the, her child is, "Oh yes, I'll stop doing that. Be, be, you know, be gentle because I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'll, you know." So she's acceding to that. Um, so that's one side of transactional analysis. It can be uh, two children. Uh, Playing in the sand, two natural children, uh, nurture, uh, two natural children, a free child, uh, playing, building sandcastles. It can be two parents. I grew up in the South, and we had a a square in front of the courthouse, a big uh, grassy square, and all the old men of the community would come to the square and sit around um, with their uh, dominoes, playing dominoes, and complaining. And they would complain to each other, you know, it's terrible the way kids are these days. The music is horrible. And, um, you know, we don't have any, you know, it's, it's awful. And then the other one would come back from his parent. So that's one parent. The other parent will come back, say, uh, yes, uh, it is awful. And it ain't it awful the way the and they, they'll go back and forth like that for, for hours. Um, 
So that's, that's uh, you know, from parent. But as long as those lines are going straight across uh, from one to the other, there's no problem with that. There's no game playing. There's no conflict. The two parents are getting on each other uh, about some third party or even about the way things are. The two children are playing together. And two adults can do the same thing uh, when you go to work and you're dealing with data uh, about things. What happens, I don't know where he went with the next slide, no. Um, another thing that can happen, and, and it's not here on the slide, but if uh, a parent makes a comment to the child or sends a transaction to the child, the, this person can then respond from an adult, say, you know, uh, well, let's go the other way. Uh, John, what time is it? And instead of telling me that the time is 1.35, John says, can't you get your own watch? So instead of being adult, adult, he's coming from his parent and responding. So what happens is then the lines cross. And when the lines cross, what happens? We all know what happens. What happens is that the conversation stops, the communication stops, everybody has bad feelings uh, from that. Okay. Um, I don't know whether, Felipe, you can even hear me. I hope you can. You may need to restart your computer or do something because you're not there. Um, you're still logged in, but we're not getting audio or visual. So let me move on. Um, existential life positions. Some of you are old enough to remember the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay, uh, from long ago. And uh, the book gave us the basic existential life positions based on growing up, based on decisions that the child make, everything that Felipe had, has already mentioned. Okay, um, I'm sorry for those, uh, for a couple of people who said they, they're, they're going away. I apologize for that. Uh, we're doing our best. Within that structure of, of existential life positions, there are four positions people tend to have, and I know you've experienced this yourself. There's, I'm okay, I'm not okay. You're okay, or you're not okay. So from that, we get these four little boxes. Felipe, are you there now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've moved on and I am explaining uh, the existential life positions on the screen. And yeah. Okay. And I've explained I'm okay, you're okay. Um, and I was going to move quickly. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, given the time that we have, I'm going to briefly go through those. Uh, I'm okay. You're okay. Is the only real position. That's the that that's the the whole concept that you have worth and dignity and can think and so can I. And that is the only real position. But we make decisions based on the impact that we have from the environment on either I'm okay and you're not. Um, that's usually from the parent operating from the parent position, and from that position we get rid of people. Um, the, the example of the lawyer that I tell you would get rid of people and move on to the next. Yeah, and then the next one, the, the next one on the right bottom, I'm not okay and you're not okay is a depressed position. Nothing will work. Everything is helpless. And this can lead to suicide. And then the you're okay and I'm not position is the over adapted position uh, operating from an I'm, uh, I'm not, I, I can't think, I can't think for myself and everybody else is better than me. And then this, these people problem by getting away from the problem, running away. So those are the, and the invitation here is always to listen for, uh, and so transactional analysis proper is going to indicate to you what ego state they're operating from. Uh, like, what do you think I should do about my problem? 
is an indicator that they're, they're thinking that I know something that they don't. And it's very easy, of course, with transference that that's going to be happening. And so the transactions with the client, it's important that we keep emphasizing, yes, you can, you can learn, you can know, what do you think, what do you know? And we also know that part of the reason that they're there is because they don't know and they do need information. And that it is that, so whenever I'm going to give parent information, I will ask permission. So I have a suggestion about that. Are you willing to, are you interested in hearing it? Because I don't want a parent without a contract, without permission. And I mean parent by just give a parent suggestion, uh, which is obvious to me that they're needing. So that's the existential positions. Are there any, any questions about anything so far? No questions to come in? People aren't asking questions, so that's okay. Anything else on, on, on existential position? It is the basis for the life script. It is the basis on what kind of strokes we're going to get, get and, and, uh, and give. Uh, and it is the basis for our life decisions. Which So here's the stroke. Um, uh, the next one is the stroke model, which is there are four types of strokes, unconditional, unconditional, positive, and negative. And we will ask for them and give them according to what our, our belief about ourselves and the, envir and the environment are. Unconditional positive or for being I love you or I hate, and then unconditional negative is I hate you or you're no good, we're to avoid those. These are just for being. Uh, all prejudices in the unconditional negative. Um, Positive, conditional are very important. You know, I love, uh, and it's for doing or having. You did great on that paper. I'm so glad you made A's. So it's, it's very good to give positive conditional strokes. However, if, if people operate only on positive conditional strokes, not, but not understanding their value at the unconditional level, this leads to problems too. And I can think of an example of Marilyn Monroe and uh, Elvis Presley. And people like that who have achieved great success in their lives at the conditional level, but never made, never got to the, that never supported the fact that they were unconditionally okay. And you don't need to prove anything. You don't have to prove yourself uh, at the unconditional level. I hope I'm not going too fast. No. At the negative, I'm yes, sorry. Uh, there's a request to redefine, uh, go over again the, the um, uh, adapted child and free child uh, concept. Would you have time to do that? I will. Let me finish okay. this right sure. here, and then I'll read, I'll read this for a minute. Uh, so the um, unconditional, oh, conditional negative strokes are important when we give feedback to say what isn't working, either in couples. We need to learn how to give negative conditional strokes. And I'm going to talk to you in a minute about a model that I use. Uh, and so I want to save time for that. About how to give negative feedback is often some organizations and couples often want to know how to use that. Always based on an unconditional positive respect for each other. And that's why I want to talk to you about what's bothering me, but we need to ask permission before we give that. Unconditional negative strokes are not OK to give. And they're to be rejected when, when received. So you say that somebody is wanting to know the difference between adaptive child and free child? Yes. The free child, yeah. The free child is the healthy ch part of ourselves that is curious, that has feelings, is sad and mad and scared and uh, creative, and, uh, and it's the part of us that motivates us, has hungers. The adaptive child is because of the developmental stages that I was talking earlier when the child is being socialized, how effective the socialization was will depend on how adapted, appropriately adapted, because the child needs to learn to be adapted. They know to raise their hand when they want to ask a question. They need to know to follow rules. They need to know, et cetera. That's appropriate socializing. But inappropriate socializing is when Oh, they follow all rules without question. Overadaptation, that's an example of overadaptation. So free child or natural child is the natural baby that develops. Adapted child is the healthy adaptation, potty training, follow the rules, how to eat at the table, not to throw food, etc. That's the adapted child, which can either be 
socially appropriately adapted or over adapted. Do you think that's enough? Yeah, there's also a question about uh, if you go over exclusions again, and uh, for example, sociopath. I would rather not do that because I want. We only have yeah, fifteen okay. minutes, and they, All right. yeah, I, I would just suggest that they read more about that on TA Today. Okay. Exclusion is just not using an ego state in the way that it was intended and avoiding my parent or avoiding my child, basically. Uh, I want to say something about the power of ego states, uh, which is the next slide, the power of strokes. And that is that strokes are as necessary as food and water and air. So children, and we as grown-ups, will go for any kind of strokes because the negative strokes satisfy the need as well as positive strokes. So you, and then the next one is stroke what you want. If parents are stroking children only when they're misbehaving or when they're sick or even couples or relationships, there's going to be a tendency to get sick or get into trouble to be yelled at in order to get the strokes. So it's important that you stroke what you want. That's a very important dynamic of strokes. And the next, the next thing I want to say about strokes is that there are all these restrictions about strokes. You're not supposed to ask for them. You're not supposed to, because you get you you who do who do you think you are? You're not supposed to accept them, because you get big headed. You're not supposed to give strokes because they think you're polishing the apple. You're not supposed to stroke yourself because you're bragging, and you're not supposed to reject strokes because after all, they're giving them to you. Well, the the, the where we want to go from here is to give permissions about all of these. It's important that you ask for strokes because we need them. Instead of setting up crooked games to get strokes, is to ask for them. Will you tell me what you like about what I've been doing today? It's, will you? <laughs> uh, don't accept strokes. That you will hear that often in in diagnosing uh, group interactions or interpersonal relations with your client. When you'll give them a stroke and they'll say, oh, it was nothing, or they will reject it or they'll change the subject, it's an indicator that they're not accepting the stroke. To accept the stroke, you will, I say things like, thank you, or wow, thank you very much. I want to take that in because I'm not used to thinking of myself that way. <laughs> Be aware of how you respond to the strokes that are being given to you uh, in, in terms of internalizing, because that's the work that, that is going to help in terms of redefining your sense of self. Uh, give strokes freely. I made that decision a long time ago that it's, if I have a stroke to give, I, very often I will ask permission, but I will give it even to strangers. And it goes a long way. And it's okay to feel, uh, to brag and feel, uh, uh, celebrate uh, successes that I have had. I start my group with people giving themselves celebrations about their successes. <laughs> And reject strokes that are unconditional negative. Um, games, I'm not going to say much about this slide because of the time, because we only have 12 minutes, right, yes. David? Yes. Yeah. So one way of understanding games is through the carbon drama triangle, which is victim, rescuer, persecutor, which you probably have heard about. And I'll just tell you briefly that uh, it starts with, very often it'll either start with persecutor, like where were you last night? That's a Nigisop game. Now I got you, you SOB. And the answer is, well, I was at the movies. And I said, well, the movie let out at 10. How come you came back at 12? And, and it goes on and on to somebody that wants to prove that the other person is not OK. And usually the person playing it with them is, excuse me, is um, a kidney player that sets themselves up to get negative strokes. I'm sorry, just a brief touch on games. And then there's a, the, uh, the uh, why don't you yes club, which we as therapists are very vulnerable to. I don't know what to do about my drinking husband, or I don't know what to do about my rebellious child. That is not a, a, a request for help. And so if you respond to, and, and that's a child to adult or child to parent request, stimulus. You need to cross that transaction. If you respond with, have you tried taking them to AA or Al-Anon or whatever, and they say, yes, but that's the game. And it's going to go on until the payoff where somebody will say, you, I can't help you, or my problem is so serious that I can't be helped, which is the existential position that the person wants to 
reinforced, or the helper who started with, have you tried AA, is going to end up with these people can't be helped. You see, these people can't be helped. Those are just a minor examples of games. These two different, these three next slides is what I want to do at the end. Uh, this is, and this you can read more about in my website, which is called winningtogether.org, and you can go to the tab called Publications. There are three articles about this model. One is called Reactivity, one is called Responsivity, and one is called about the, the use of role, the use of feelings in the workplace. But this is one of the first things that I teach um, clients, and that is that feelings are friends. They're very important, and they're not People have the idea that I want to not be scared or not be sad or not be mad. You need to find out why you're sad, mad, and scared, and then figure out what to do in order to take care of yourself about them. Mad, sad, and scared are like thirst and hunger and having to go to the bathroom. They're indicators of a need. Sad is a loss, or, uh, and you need to grieve. Anger is an intrus intrusive of a boundary and you need to set a limit. And uh, scared is a real or imagined um, uh, threat. And that imagined threat very often comes from that magical child that I was talking about, intuitive child. So you want to, when somebody's checking out a fantasy with you about whether you're mad at them, it's important to give them the seed of truth because you want to stroke their intuition and at the same time give them a fact. I'll talk more about that in just a minute when we go to the external model. One thing I want to say in addition to that about the feelings is the substitution or the racket. Uh, be aware of the substitution uh, factor down here. The substitution factor is that sex role stereotyping in particular families will allow feelings or not feelings. In general, in our culture, men are not to Okay. It looks like we've lost the gentleman again. Um, let me try to pick up here if I can. And I'm not even going to try to deal with the internal response process. Uh, you know, briefly, uh, um, Bill, you asked about uh, the exclusions. I can say a word about that. Uh, the exclusion is simply where the person behaves as though he has no uh, parent. But in the case of sociopath, as if he has no child. So his whole response to everything is to use his adult to enforce uh, the parental the parental uh, I don't know what uh, response anyway. Um, now I haven't actually pursued that. Uh, I have not pursued working with sociopaths, so I don't really have a, a better response for you. Uh, and I apologize for that. Uh, I am going to, when I put this up on the website, I am going to uh, include um, a bibliography, and uh, hopefully that will help a little bit. Um, okay. I am back. So we got about uh, seven minutes? Yeah, we do. Can I finish this? Yeah, go ahead. I like it. Yeah. All right, so I, I was a substitute factor. Did I finish that? Did you all get that? The substitution factor is important because very often an angry man, if you decode what the anger is about, is really that he's scared or sad. And uh, or a sad or scared woman is really that she's angry. And I have found a lot of help for people in just helping them figure out what the feeling is because very often it's a substitute feeling. And that's the internal responsive process. Uh, in term, the internal responsive is re responding internally to the feelings, to one's feelings and figuring out what I need. The external responsive process is going to the world outside and practicing these seven uh, behaviors, which is asking for wants, checking out, um, interpretation of other people's behaviors. We call it checking out fantasies. I have a feeling that you're dissatisfied with my work. What's true and what's not true about that? And I was saying earlier that it's important to give them the seed of truth in order to stroke their intuition. And because they're picking up on something, they're not picking up on nothing. Don't tell people who say, are you mad, Daddy? Don't say, no, I'm not. 
Or don't tell a wife or a husband who say, are you angry at me? No. Say, well, not that I'm aware of, but let me think about it. What, what you may be picking up. The response to an, uh, checking out an intuition is very critical and very important and very sensitive in order to stroke the other person's intuition. Verbalizing resentments is when, I have, when I'm angry and I need to set, share with you a feeling, ask permission for it. Can I, I, I have a resentment that I'd like to share. And the, the goal of that is to share it so that they hear it. And, and they, you may want them to change behavior or not. That's, that, that's a going back to asking for what you want. Uh, and the response to the resentment is basically, I, I hear that you have a I hear how you're feeling about that. Stroking yourself or others, sharing, um, sharing pertinent information like I'll be late to, I'll be late tonight, or uh, we need to, will you please pay the electric bill, etc. And the other two are setting limits. Uh, you're not, not to do that to me. You're not to go into my purse anymore. Or if you use my material, you're to give me credit. And I wanted to say a little bit about accounting in the last few minutes that we have here. Um, Accounting is what we normally talk about when we talk about um, apologizing. And apologizing can be a game in that somebody messes up and says, I'm sorry, and they get forgiven, and they mess up and they get, I'm sorry, and they're forgiven. That's a game. And accounting is being responsible for an error, for, for something that I, over, I overlooked. For example, uh, I had a client that um, didn't show up for an appointment last week. Um, and it was interesting to see the options, which I didn't say in ego state, that the five behavioral ego state gives you five options in terms of how to, what ego state you want to use and to respond to them. Uh, it could have been critical parent, I, I'm really mad at you for not showing up. It could have been adult, I was aware that you sh didn't show up last time, what was that about? But we had already talked about the fact that he knew. Accounting in that example, so it would be, I apologize for not having shown up last time. What happened, what was going on with me was that I normally set a, a, a reminder on my iPhone to remind me when I have an appointment because I get very involved in my work. He's an engineer. Um, and what I didn't do was set up the reminder. And what I plan to do next time is to set it up. And accounting in the external responsive process has to be all of those parts all three of those parts. And, and I think it, it's very useful in terms of changing behavior and in terms of uh, uh, apologizing to people. So we covered the outline pretty much. Is there a question? Comment, there's too much good here to let technical issues get in the way. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry about the technical issues. Uh, any questions that you want to ask in the last few minutes that we have? Hmm. Special offer. Yeah, we're coming to the end, so I, I want to. Uh, apparently, there aren't any. Uh, say a couple words. We have um, been given a a um, an offer uh, by Psychotherapy Net, uh, which is a great little organization that has videos uh, from uh, Eric Byrne from. Uh, uh, all kinds of folk, yeah. and they uh, found out about our webinar series, contacted me to make an offer that anybody who'd like to pursue, not just TA, but anything, uh, they'll provide a 25% discount on their subscription service. So, you know, um, here it is, here's their, their address. Uh, there is a question, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, about uh, certificate, um, and the offer is good to start a subscription before the end of 2014, and uh, there's this discount card, and so on and so on. You you guys can read that. Um, at your convenience. Um, here is the last part of this. The video of the webinar will be published in a few days. Uh, I'm going to have to do some editing to get get pieces together. Every registered person will receive the username and password to be able to see the video. You also get an evaluation form by email. 
and I'd appreciate if you could uh, complete it and just return it by email. It, uh, for those who have signed up for CEUs, that, eva that, that evaluation form is, is mandatory. Everybody else, it's optional, uh, even though I'd appreciate it. Um, somebody's asked for a certificate that you've attended the webinar for your records. I'll be glad to make up a certificate and send it out to everybody. That um, that certificate obviously is not the equivalent for CEUs, and the, the CEU thing uh, is a separate issue. But those who have paid for CEUs will get them, and uh, if you get, send me the email. So that's kind of the story. I suggest that anybody who's interested in TA a little bit go on the on the internet and look up Fuzzy Tail, the Fuzzy Tail. Uh, it's an entertaining, um, an entertaining, uh, I don't know, myth story that came out of Claude Steiner's brain many many years ago, and um, you'll enjoy it. It's a little sexist uh, from today's point of view, but back when it was written, uh, it was not considered sexist. Again, the fuzzy tale. Um, I appreciate everybody having been here, and as you drop off, uh, do go to the website, the www.aapc.pacrig.org, and you will find there uh, in a few days the video and and as I said, a, a bibliography, which I'll produce for you. Thank everybody for being here. Thank you for your for your patience. Um, we we do run into this kind of problem every so often, a technical problem. Our next webinar will be on group psychotherapy. Uh, Haim Weinberg will, has already given this before the Pacific Region Conference, and he's basically using the same presentation. And uh, it was. Uh, an amazing and useful presentation on the group dynamics and group psychotherapy. He is, um, Haim has, was the president of the International um, Group Psychotherapy Society. Uh, he now is the head of group psychotherapy for uh, a university in this area. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that one too. Thanks again. Thank you, Felipe. I appreciate your effort. And we've had a good day.